First of all, welcome. My name is Mike Frank. I'm the director here at Hoover's DC office, so welcome. And I just want to start off with some really, really bad news. This is the last event of the year in Hoover, DC. <laughs> last time you can have a chance to drink our wine, eat our food, and, <laughs> and receive intellectual stimulation on an important issue of the day. So thanks for coming. A lot of you are familiar faces. Uh, and we'll be doing, as you can imagine, a lot of this next year. So welcome. Quickly, I'm going to introduce Sam Tadros, who's our Distinguished Visiting Fellow in Middle Eastern Studies here at Hoover. Uh, he's a contributor to one of our working groups on Islamism and the International Order. He's a Research Fellow at the Hud Hudson Institute Center for Religious Freedom. And, not that he needs one more hat, but he has it as a professional lecturer at the uh, Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at Hopkins University. So I'm going to turn it over to Sam. He's a great addition to our corral of experts here in Washington, and we really enjoy working with him on this and other events. So Sam, it's all yours. Good afternoon, and welcome everyone here at the Hoover Institution. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Samuel Tadros, and I'll be hosting the discussion here today. The Hoover Institution is an organization that is dedicated to the twin tasks of fighting for economic opportunity for people around the world, as well as maintaining American security and defense of a robust US role around the world. Having that distinction, the Hoover Institution is unique in having among its fellows, current fellows, two former secretaries of state, and one might add, a fellow leaving now, a future secretary of defense. Our aim here at the Hoover Institution's office in DC is to bring that kind of scholarship by Hoover scholars to the Washington community engaging with our work. Today we will be discussing Arab Fall, how the Muslim Brotherhood won and lost Egypt in 891 days. In his commentary magazine review of the book, Michael Totten has called it the definitive account of the Muslim Brotherhood's rise and fall. This is, it certainly is. Utilizing years of research conducted through more than a dozen trips to Egypt during the past six years, Eric Traeger tells a story that is often misunderstood of in Washington, of how a group dreaming of reaching power for 83 years finally achieved that, grabbing the opportunity of the revolutionary upheaval in Egypt starting 2011. But how also it quickly lost that power and fell from grace in, after only one year in power. But this book is not solely a book about Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, or Islamism in general. Throughout the time of the Muslim Brotherhood's rise and fall, we read of Western analysis and misunderstandings of the group, its ideology, its goals, what its, its structure and other aspects. Arab Fall may tell the story of this rise and fall of the Brotherhood, but it equally tells the story of the rise, if not necessarily the complete fall, of Western misconceptions about the group and of the very nature of politics in Egypt and the region. On the cover of Arab Fall, The Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg describes Eric as Washington's go-to expert on Egypt. As the Esther Wagner Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Eric has emerged since 2011 as a key voice in the Egypt debate in Washington. In numerous articles appearing in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, The Atlantic, and The New Republic, he was a voice of reason at a time and in a city that has not known many of those voices in its debate about events in Egypt. Dr. Traeger received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, where he served as an adjunct professor, his MA from the American University in Cairo, and a BA from Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Eric Traeger for our conversation of his excellent book. As a matter of logistics, Eric will say a few words on his book, after which I will be discussing the book themes with him until 6.30, after which I will open the floor for questions. Well, I just want to thank, uh, first of all, everybody here 
for coming out. Obviously, there's a lot going on in Washington at this time of the year, a lot of parties, a lot of talks, and I just really appreciate you coming out and, and making the time for, for this book event. And, of course, I want to thank Sam, who, in addition to being so generous in, in putting this event together, uh, has been a tremendous guide for me in understanding Egypt over the years and someone whose work I very much uh, look up to, and, uh, and I mentioned that in the book. So uh, it's, in, it's in writing and in words, so really thank you. Uh, very much. Uh, I just want to speak briefly about the book, just to open up the conversation. Um, what this book tries to do is tell a story. It tries to tell a story about how a very specific type of organization utilized a specific political opening uh, to reach power, and then how the very characteristics that enabled it to win power sowed the seeds of its downfall. So just to sort of give a few specifics here. The Muslim Brotherhood is not like most other political organizations in Egypt. It's not something that is analogous to the Democrat or Republican Party uh, in the United States. It's not a, an organization that you join by going to the DMV and signing a box on a form. Um, joining a, the Muslim Brotherhood is a five to eight year process in which every single member is promoted through multiple ranks of membership. And as they are promoted through this organization, they are vetted for their commitment to the cause and the commitment to the organization and their willingness to follow orders. Right there, you should understand that the Muslim Brotherhood is much closer to being a cult than it is a political party. It's an organization that weeds out people who might not be fully aligned with its theocratic vision to ensure a certain uniformity of goals within its ranks. And at the end of the process of becoming a Muslim brother, every member swears an oath to listen and obey orders from leaders. Secondly, once one becomes a Muslim brother, uh, he is placed in a cell known as a family in Usra of roughly five to 10 individuals. These cells were historically scattered throughout Egypt in every neighborhood. And there's a command chain with all these cells answering to a central leadership known as the guidance office that was based in Cairo. When you understand that the Muslim Brotherhood is comprised, A, of deeply committed individuals who are vetted over the course of a five to eight year peri period for their commitment to the cause, and B, that they are organized with a chain of command, you know right there that you're dealing with an organization that uh, has a, a, a certain uh, internal process with a certain set of goals that can be mobilized towards those goals. You know that you're dealing with an organization of people who have spent so long just trying to join that they're not the kinds of people that will moderate in power. They're not the kinds of people that might rethink elements of this organization's ideology because they had to swear to that ideology and be vetted for their commitment to that ideology uh, as part of the membership um, process. Um, what is that ideology? Just in brief, the Muslim Brotherhood seeks to establish a global Islamic state from the grassroots up. It seeks to recruit people to its organization through that process I described spread within the society through political activities, social activities, outreach, preaching, education. Then, once it achieves sufficient societal support, it aims to get uh, political power, executive authority, and that's the point that the Brotherhood believed it had reached in its history uh, after the 2011 uprising with the election of Mohammed Morsi. And finally, it wants to see this process rising from the individual to the family to the society to the state play out in countries across the Middle East so that all of these countries under brotherhood control will unify in a global Islamic state. That is different, by the way, from what a group like ISIS or Al-Qaeda wants, where the goal is, especially with ISIS, to establish a caliphate now, convince later. The brotherhood is pursuing it in the reverse. They want to convince now and over time build that neo-caliphate. The problem is that here in Washington, the fact that the Brotherhood has a longer term process, a grassroots up process rather than a top down process, the fact that they tried to pursue power through the ballot box led many people in Washington to believe that they were moderates. Moderates, mind you, because they were not Al Qaeda. Moderates because they were not Al Qaeda. I'm not, I think, uh, oversimplifying this argument. You can read foreign affairs articles from the second part of the previous decade 
You could read think tank papers about this that were put out both before and after the 2011 uprising. The argument was that in the pantheon of Islamist movements, the Brotherhood was moderate because it pursued power through the ballot box, not strictly or primarily through violence. All of that obscured the fact that this was still a totalitarian organization of deeply committed people with command and control seeking total control of the region. Now, on one hand, a group that couldn't even control Egypt, where it's from, where it had worked for over eight decades, couldn't even control Egypt for more than a year, has no prospect of controlling the region. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't believe it will ultimately control the region someday, and that's why the Brotherhood, even despite these setbacks, will probably keep moving in one form or another. But the point I'm trying to make here is that um, we in Washington, uh, not, not me personally, but there were those in Washington who, uh, in trying to find Islamist heroes, in trying to find uh, Islamists with whom the United States could work, focused on the Brotherhood strictly because the Brotherhood seeks power through elections, um, and built them up as the moderates strictly because they were not al-Qaeda. My argument about policy is, is really very straightforward. If you can't get right an organization that's been around for over eight decades, that's very clear about how it works, how it recruits, what its ultimate goals are. By the way, what I just laid out, you could have found through a Google search five or six years ago. You could have seen on YouTube videos. You didn't need to buy my book, although I ask that you do. <laughs> it was all out there to see what this group was about. And frankly, they were very open with me about how they worked, how they recruited, what their goals were. There's this idea, by the way, that Muslim brothers are liars, that they, you know, that they spin things. Honestly, I found them to be extremely honest. How else would I have learned how they worked, how they recruit, how they do command and control, and what their ultimate goals are? The problem was here in Washington. The problem was with the attempt to try to find Islamist heroes with whom we can work. So if we can't be clear about a group like the Muslim Brotherhood that has the history that it does, that's as open about the way it works and what its goals are as it is, how are we going to choose moderates in a place like Syria, where we're talking about groups that have emerged only within the last five years? How are we going to reliably pick moderates anywhere? What I'm trying to say is the policy lesson with Egypt, and uh, not just with the Muslim Brotherhood, but with the way we view Egyptian politics here in Washington, the policy lesson is we need to we need to be a lot more careful about looking at what's under the hood of these organizations and try to avoid uh, you know, seeing moderates strictly because they are not at this moment cutting heads off. With that, happy note. <laughs> well, let me start with this argument about the organization. Protecting the organization for the Muslim Brotherhood emerged as not only a key important issue for them, but per perhaps the sole reason for their very existence. Um, you discussed in the book a speech that Khairat al-Shatr, the deputy head of the Muslim Brotherhood, gave in April of 2011, where he talked about the centrality of the concept of an organization for achieving the dream of an Islamic State. He even described it as the very methodology that the Prophet himself had adopted. Why did this emphasis on organization emerge for the Muslim Brotherhood? Great question. So the, you know, first of all, it's important to understand that the Muslim Brotherhood emerged in this uh, intellectual environment in which Muslim thinkers in the late 1800s, early 1900s, were asking themselves the following question. Uh, why has Islam fallen behind the West? Right? It's called the crisis of modernity. Why is it that Islam, which was on the cutting edge of science and technology uh, and politics during the early centuries of its revelation, why is it now dominated by the Europe politically through imperialism and colonialism, but also culturally? Why are Egyptians looking to France and England, etc., for styles of dress? Um, and, uh, and one of the answers that was given by a group of thinkers who are now known as the modernists uh, was that uh, Islamic teaching had fallen behind, that Islamic teaching had calcified, it had failed to integrate modernity effectively. There was no contradiction between modern technology, modern practices, and Islam where those practices could be beneficial to moving the society forward. But the key was reviving Islam, that essentially what, what ailed 
the Islamic world uh, could be healed through a proper interpretation of the Sharia, and the answer was therefore to implement the Sharia. The Muslim Brotherhood took this idea that reviving the Islamic world against the West meant reviving Islam and provided an organizational mechanism. How are you going to revive Islam? Um, and so the idea was, well, you need to recruit individuals who could effectively serve as foot soldiers for this organization. That's that five to eight year process that I briefly described in my opening remarks. Um, and you need to mobilize them so that they first reach out to families, which then spread their message in the society, which ultimately achieve state power, which then produces the uh, you know, revitalization of this very politicized interpretation of Islam across the region so that it establishes a neo-caliphate. The Muslim Brotherhood's organization is a mechanism for reviving Islam politically. Why? Again, to ultimately undo what the uh, you know what many thinkers at this time saw as Western domination and ultimately to challenge the West and as you rightly point out um, you know the Muslim Brotherhood uh, Hassan al-Banna and later of course Herod al shatter saw this model of a of a sort of pyramidal command chain as being the model of, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad and his early community. And by the way, this is a very standard thing that Islamist groups do. They try to draw analogies between their own political practices, their own ideology, their own ideas about you know, interpreting the Sharia from the, uh, from the, the, the first decades of, uh, of Islam as a way to legitimate their vision. I wanted just to go back to the starting point of the book, um, the Egyptian revolution. Um, at that moment when the revolution started, the Brotherhood, of course, was not the first group to jump in support of it. It was late. You described the decision-making process, their fears at the time. One of the most important fears is fearing to become the face of the revolution. In their eyes, if they would become the face of the revolution, both the West and the Egyptian military would move against them. They were very keen in describing their roles as back. They allowed others to appear in the um, front pages of Western coverage on CNN, on all of that. But they also weren't the only ones, in a sense, downplaying the Brotherhood's role. They had useful idiots. Uh, Mohammed al-Baradai, who you describe in one of your articles uh, back in 2011 as Egypt's great white nope. Um, great liberal nope. Liberal nope. <laughs> great liberal nope. You, he came on CNN and said that the Brotherhood would only win 10% in a future Egyptian election. Um, they were only a, um, a scarecrow that Mubarak was using. Why were so many, not just in the West, but in Egypt itself, fooled by the organization? I think you had a scenario in Egypt where, um, frankly, because politics had been so constrained for so long, political actors in many cases especially in the opposition, uh, did not really know the country more broadly. Um, secondly, I think you had a tendency to overinterpret the dynamics of the protests uh, of that you know, kind of Arab Spring moment, January 25th, 2011, up until Mubarak uh, stepped down on February 11th, overinterpret that because really those protests were catalyzed by a certain segment of, of youthful, um, we use that term, by the way, relatively, uh, these were typically people in their, you know, uh, mid-30s and early 40s. No offense to anyone here, you're all very <laughs> youthful. Um, um, but, uh, but uh, you know, uh, so these were typically kind of youth activists who were, um, some of them Islamists for sure, but by and large, leftists, socialists, communists, Nasserists, a smattering of people that, that we might actually call liberals. Um, and uh, and th so there was this view that, well, these guys had, had started it. These were the guys that had brought people into the streets. Yes, the Muslim Brotherhood joined, but they joined late. And uh, these revolutionaries would probably be at the, at the forefront of change. Uh, the problem was that after Mubarak fell, the ease with which these uh, disparate actors had unified people against Mubarak uh, was, you know, it was not as easy to unify people um, in favor of something else. And that's where a group like the Muslim Brotherhood, which is not, is not tremendous by Egyptian standards, maybe a few hundred thousand in a country that at the time was, you know, roughly 80 million, um, you know, so, so a big organization, but certainly nothing on par with one of our major political parties in the United States, uh, was able to 
win because A, it had the organization, it had a certain ideological vision, and it, unlike any other political player in the whole country, was able to mobilize on a nationwide scale. You know, I mean, I remember having these conversations in both Egypt and Washington about the Brotherhood's prospects after the uprising. People would say, well, you know, maybe it'll win 10% of the vote, 20%, 25%. And I would always look at them, and I had, you know, been doing my PhD research on Egyptian opposition parties, and I just looked at them and I said, I said well, who, who in Egypt gets the other... 75 to 90 percent. Um, if you'd if you'd spent any time, as I had, with you know the Waft Party, with the Dagamu Party, uh, with some of these smaller parties that emerged by the dozen after the uprising, I, I mean these were these were just not uh, you know fully mobilized units. These these parties over the course of Mubarak's roughly 30 years in power had basically become social clubs. Uh, Literally, in certain cases, the Tagamu Party's headquarter was a former nightclub where guys sat around, played cards, and talked about the 1960s when they were all communists. So that's what political life was. Um, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, that's what political life was beyond the Brotherhood. So, you know, even if you didn't know a ton about what was going on deeper in the society or didn't understand the political structure of the society, you should have, at least if you were an Egyptian politician, known that there was no other group in the country that could mobilize effectively, cohesively on a nationwide scale. And the Brotherhood was by design able to do this. They had foot soldiers. They had command and control. Nobody else had this. So they had a great organization. It helped them reach power. And they came to power, and suddenly they were supposed to govern. Before coming to power, they talked about the Renaissance project. They had this project that would change Egypt, uh, change the region. It would impact every aspect of life. I remember a scholar from DC uh, writing that he met Schotter, and Schotter showed him blueprints of all kinds of plans and projects that they had. Well, they come to power, and everyone discovers they have nothing. Despite the long history, despite the large number of followers, the Brotherhood was so unprepared for governance. How was the organization so unqualified? The, um, the Muslim Brotherhood had, as you said, something called the Renaissance Project. And I, you know, I had a copy of it. I had, I had been given it in Cairo. The Renaissance Project was a list of aspirations basically with no real plan. It, it, I used to joke that it's, it would be the equivalent of me saying I have an Eric Traeger plan, I'm going to play shortstop for the Mets next year. And you're looking at me and you're like, well, you know, you're 5'7 and not that athletic, so how are you going to do that? And I would just say, no, it's going to happen, you'll see. That's what this was. You know, we're going to have this percentage of growth. I'm not a terrible fielder, by the way. Um, we, we, you know, we'll have this percentage of growth, uh, which means I'm a bad hitter. Um, you know, we'll have uh, uh, this type of investment. Where, you know, and, and, and there was no real uh, process for getting that. Why? Uh, look, part of it is just, is just because of political legacies. You know, this was a group that had been uh, largely shut out of power. Um, you know, it, it is fair to make the point that uh, parties that come to power right after an uprising with no real experience tend to fail. So from that, you know, in that respect, the Brotherhood uh, was not so different from others. Um, but, you know, there, there was something else at play. Go back to that ideological vision of the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood says it's going to um, build a global Islamic state by spreading its message, um, you know, first by recruiting people, then the families, then the society, then the state, and then this will happen across the region, will have a global Islamic state. Well, what does it mean to have a, an Islamic state or global Islamic state? What it meant to the Brotherhood was having Islamists in power. The Brotherhood had this idea that if you had Islamists in power, in other words, them in power, people that thought like them, had been recruited as they had been recruited, sworn the oath that they had sworn, you would have people in power who were not corrupt, who you know, really worked in support of moral religious principles, and this would have a certain type of transformational effect. So let's not talk about tax policy or foreign policy or economic policy. What matters is who's in charge. We are Muslim brothers. We are good people. Put us in charge. Everything will be good. I'm not exaggerating that. When I would meet with them after Morsi won, I meet with senior leaders. I met with a guy who's known as the Muslim Brotherhood Mufti, and I would say to them, you know, 
what is your education policy? What is your tax policy? What's your foreign policy? I mean, like, tell me you're going to destroy Israel. I mean, I don't like the answer, but like, at least it's an answer. Just give me an answer. What are you going to do? Uh, they had they had nothing. They had absolutely no idea. And um, it was, again, because they really believed that an Islamist state meant Islamists in power. They would win elections. They would come to power. That would have a transformative effect. And actually, nothing would change um, in terms of policy. And actually, you know, I quote in the book very senior leaders in the Brotherhood telling me this, that you know, very little will actually change. It's just that because Islamists are power, people will live morally. They'll follow the laws. There will be no crime. Again, Eric Traeger is going to play shortstop for the Mets in the spring. <laughs> But it's not just not having actual programs and policies. Even the ideology itself was shallow. I mean, you look at the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, and you look at Salafis in Egypt, for example. The Salafis had an actual content there within yes. what Islamism meant. The Brotherhood was, at the end, the way you described it, just a vanguard organization, but one in the sense that had lost any content of its own message throughout that 80-year process. That's absolutely true. I mean, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood really is not an intellectual movement. They've produced in over 80 years of their existence and very few thinkers is a point that you've made, and I completely agree with it. Um, Hassan al-Banna, Syed Qutb, uh, you know, you could throw in Goma Amin, but really, really very thin um, ideological output for an organization of that size and, and of that, um, you know, dur durability. With the Salafists, when I would ask them the same question, all right, if you reach power, what are you going to do? They would give me an answer. They'd say, all right, every woman's going to wear a hijab. I don't like the answer, but it's an answer. I mean, they could at least say something that would change if they were uh, in power. They, you know, so so that is that is different. I'm not saying, by the way, that the Salafists, you know, because of that answer, have a great uh, intellectual output either. Um, but what makes Salafism different from the Muslim Brotherhood is the Muslim Brotherhood is an organization. It's an organization that is constructed for empowering its message among individuals, families, within the society, the state, and ultimately empowering it on the global level. That's the goal. Salafism is basically the idea that you know Muslims should return to the practices uh, of the Prophet Muhammad and his early community. And how they interpret that and how they pursue it uh, really varies by preacher, by organization, by mosque. You can be in an organization, not an organization, be political, be quietist. There's just a w much wider range. That means within Salafism, there's a host of, de of debates that give you some kind of intellectual output because the Muslim Brotherhood is a very close society that only accepts true believers and only vets people for their belief and only accepts those who swear an oath to listen and obey. You just don't have that kind of internal dissent. You do have internal dissent with the Brotherhood over tactics. Should we run for president now or later? Should we run for this many seats in parliament or that many seats? Should we resist violently or not violently? I mean, these are, these are ongoing you know, debates within the Muslim Brotherhood, but they're debates about tactics. They're not debates about ideological vision. Throughout the 1980s and pretty much until the Egyptian Revolution, the Brotherhood had done a concentrated effort to reach out to other elements of Egyptian political life. They uh, started a... Um, um, a joint list, electoral list, with the Waft Party in 84, with the Amal Party in 87. In syndicates, they reached out. They even held an annual iftar where they invited other non-Islamists to these events. Suddenly, that behavior, in a sense, changes after the revolution. How is, an how is it that an organization that has been so good at deceiving others, at creating bonds of support across the ideology, in a sense, in, in deceiving people like Barrett and others, was unwilling to continue doing such practices once it reached power and alienated so many segments of Egyptian society. Well, we should remember that the Muslim Brotherhood tried to do that. Um, you know, after the revolution in 2011, the months that followed, there was a lot of work done to try to build a pretty broad electoral coalition. They, they were alliance. briefly, yeah. right, the Democratic Alliance for Egypt. It was a coalition with the WAF party primarily, but ultimately with as many as 40 parties, ranging from, you know, far leftist to Salafist. It broke down. Why did it break down? As I described in the book, because basically the Muslim Brotherhood had made this promise that it w wouldn't run for a majority of seats. So what it instead tried to do was put together this broad coalition in which it would have the plurality of seats, but because it would mobilize nationwide, 
all of the other partners would owe the Brotherhood for their victories. So it was the way that the Brotherhood would not have the majority keep its promise, but at the same time be able to control the coalition. And this very much alienated other parties. Some of the parties believe that they deserved more seats than the Brotherhood was willing to afford them. Um, some just didn't like the, the Brotherhood's brass knuckle uh, tactics. So I think part of it is that the Brotherhood at a certain point after this decided, you know, this is our moment. There's been an uprising. There's been a revolution. We have obviously won enough societal support to win these elections. Now is our moment to establish the Islamic State in Egypt. And Brotherhood leaders were, were actually pretty clear with me about that, especially after Morsi won. But it was also the fact that their attempts at trying to work behind coalitions of other parties just rubbed those other parties the wrong way. I mean, when you talk about this is our moment, this is a theme that Charter mentions maybe eight times in that April 2011 speech. We are at a historical moment. This is our chance to really begin our project. How much did this actually impact the Brotherhood's behavior versus the organizational reasons that you describe? Look, you have to remember that when the Muslim Brotherhood agreed to, uh, to you know, announce that it would not run a presidential candidate and that it would not run for a majority of parliamentary seats, two promises that it ultimately broke, it did so the day before Mubarak stepped down, February 10th, 2011. It did so at the moment that Shatter, who was and, and certainly became the Brotherhood's key political strategist, uh, you know, he's a deputy supreme guide, he's, he's the second in command of the whole organization, he was in prison. So it is, it is an interesting question whether the Brotherhood would have made those promises had he not been in prison. So that's, that's the first thing. I'm not really sure. Um, the, the second thing, though, to, to think about um, with Shatter is he's saying in that speech, it's our moment, and, and he clearly believes that the Brotherhood is on the precipice of something, but he's also saying that the Brotherhood's uh, outreach work will continue. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run for parliamentary seats, but you know, it's going to have other types of discussions. He sees that clearly something has changed for the Brotherhood, but this is still April 2011, and I'm not sure that even he fully appreciates how open the the field is in that moment and so that's why you do have the brotherhood still in this in this short interim period trying to work with other parties until it decides that a that's a lot harder than anticipated and b it really doesn't need to um, the other thing is you know you have this dynamic within the brotherhood where because indoctrination is such an essential element of being a muslim brother and because there is this prolonged recruitment and vetting process muslim brothers are told that it's their job to rule Egypt and ultimately the world. And I cite in the book top brotherhood leaders at encampments telling young Muslim brothers this, this is your moment. We're supposed to rule. We should be in charge. Uh, you could go on YouTube. You'll see a video of the Supreme Guide of the Muslim Brotherhood later in this period saying that, it's, you know, that they should be uh, dominating Christians. You know, this is an organization that has very totalitarian power-seeking aims. And so when it got to these points, where do we run for majority of seats or not? Do we run for president or not? It did face this pressure from below, from lower in its ranks, where youths were saying, hey, look, you, know, you said our moment is now. Well, why are we running for you know, a majority of the seats? You said our moment is now. Why aren't you running a presidential candidate? Why aren't you going for gold? So in a certain sense, the Muslim Brotherhood's ideology of empowerment, its totalitarianism, absolutely caught up with it and propelled its leadership to pursue power more quickly than they might have otherwise wanted to. Your, your mention of shelter and, and being out in prison at that moment leads me to the next question. Since mid-2011 and until basically the Brotherhood's ouster, and perhaps even later, Shatter was portrayed basically as the Brotherhood's version of Omar Suleiman, Egypt's famed spy master, uh, the secretive man behind the scene, the strong man behind the throne, the one that uh, controlled everything. Um, he was the one to reach out to and to cut the deals with. What's your assessment of his character? My assessment is that because this was an organization that so depended on command and control, and because, um, look, you got to understand, for the Muslim Brotherhood, what I've laid out in terms of the recruitment and the nature of the command chain is not bureaucratic trivia. It's not, you know, it's not like just a sort of boring org chart. Uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood, that recruitment process, that 
way of mobilizing people, cells answering to a central command chain, is what they believe is necessary for reviving Islam, establishing an Islamic state, and over time a global Islamic state. They believe that that specific structure is not incidental. It's actually essential to achieving their vision. So I do think that this is an organization in which figures like Shatter uh, can exert that kind of control. It's also true that this is an organization that faced cross currents, an organization in which, yes, when youths are educated that it's their moment, that, that they should be pursuing power, and it seems like it's their moment, they will appeal to their leaders, and, and there will be that kind of, that kind of dialogue. But my sense uh, in interviewing the organization during this time, in interviewing leaders of the organization, was that uh, Shatter was very much a power center. He was, by the way, not the only power center. Even that Renaissance team, and I spell this out in the book, that was responsible for building um, a, a very flaky set of policy options, was divided between two teams, and he only controlled uh, one of them. But nonetheless, uh, he, was, he was a central leader, uh, a, a central figure in the leadership. Uh, and just the nature of an organization that depends so much on command and control for pursuing its vision uh, makes it reasonable to believe that he did possess that power uh, within the organization. You know, the reason I ask about this is, you know, there's a debate about the role of personalities versus institutions in politics. Um, it's, it's always been an interesting proposition for me whether if Tantawi was Egypt's military commander in July or June 2013, whether the coup would have happened and all of this instead of Sisi being there. If we imagine that Khaira Tushatur, who was the original Brotherhood candidate for president, had been allowed indeed to run and they didn't have to go to the, the spare part, as the Egyptians jokingly referred to him, Mohammed Morsi, would things have turned out different? It's a, it's, a, it's a good counter, you know, it's, it's a good hypothetical question, obviously. I mean, let me um, put it this way. Sure. Morsi was especially weak in the eyes of people. He wasn't someone that commanded respect in any audience. People made fun of him. He was a caricature. Shutter commanded a presence, even if you disagreed with him. Look, I'm, I, I interviewed both men for this book, um, and I would, I would agree with that assessment that, that uh, look, to, to just kind of spell out my own experience with Morsi, the guy was a very unpleasant, nasty man um, who uh, it talked to any Western journalist who interviewed him, um, whether they were optimistic about the Brotherhood or pessimistic about the Brotherhood, and I say this in the book, they all knew Morsi and knew that the guy was a, a jerk and a laughing stock, and uh, and that's why actually many were were pessimistic um, about Egypt's trajectory after he was like we, we we met the guy. I mean, to meet the guy is to sort of uh, be very unimpressed. Shatter did give off a very different image. This is a successful businessman. This is a man who um, I, I actually interviewed him in his apartment. I think a week or two after he was released from prison in 2011. Uh, clearly beloved by uh, Muslim brothers. Clearly revered by Muslim Brotherhood youths at least at this time. Um, and, and he did have a certain uh, charisma, just in part due to his size and, and due to his, uh, he's, he was a massive, is a massive person. I mean, he's what, like six, five? Four I mean, a lot of people time. feel massive to me, but I mean, this was, <laughs> you know, this was a big guy. But he also, also a smart guy and someone who spoke in, in, in full paragraphs. All that said, the reason why Morsi fell was not because he was a jerk. Um, he fell because he pursued power in a very ham-handed way. He alienated many people. He alienated many political institutions. And he did that um, in a way that really bore the marks of the Muslim Brotherhood as an institution more broadly and not necessarily of him. It was inevitable, I would argue, after the uprising that there would be this power struggle between the strongest governmental institution, the military, and the strongest uh, political actor, the Muslim Brotherhood, and that power struggle plays out in the book constantly, and it, it really ebbs and flows, and there are moments where they're sort of on the same page, but you just, you just always knew through this period that uh, things wouldn't, wouldn't stay totally calm forever because they, they did have certain types of competing interests, and I think that that would have been true even if Shatter was in power, and I think because the Muslim, here, here's for me the important point about the Muslim Brotherhood. There's this idea in Washington that the Muslim Brotherhood is a mainstream Islamist organization. A couple things about this. First of all, 
mainstream. There are probably more Salafists uh, in Egypt, and therefore you could argue that Salafism is far more mainstream. Secondly, uh, Sunni Islam is by nature non-hierarchical. It's extremely diverse. You're talking over a billion people spread across the world, probably spread across almost every country in the world, who naturally practice Islam, uh, interpret Islam in millions of, of different ways. There's no single Islamist group that can claim to have a monopoly on the proper interpretation of Islam. And as soon as a group does that, says that it represents the true Islam, you should follow me. If you don't, you're a bad Muslim. Well, guess what? That group is going to alienate somebody. Uh, there is no such thing, is what I'm trying to say, as a mainstream Islamist organization, because there is no political interpretation of Islam that is mainstream. The political interpretation of Islam is inherently contentious. And as soon as a group like the Brotherhood emerges and claims that it has a monopoly, uh, you're going to see problems. So that's why. While Morsi, uh, like I said, was a very nasty man, very unpleasant person, uh, I think the Brotherhood would have run into similar problems had Shatter been in charge. Because the second you say, hey, what I represent is true Islam and what you represent is not, that's it. And, and on a certain level, that's what happened in Egypt. Let me move to Washington. Throughout um, the two and a half years from the Egyptian revolution to the fall of the Brotherhood, the U.S. developed a strategy, an engagement with the Muslim Brotherhood. A decision was announced on the 30th of June, 2011, to start that engagement. Walk us through the thinking of the Obama administration as it looked at that situation in Egypt and made that decision that they would reach out to the Brotherhood and in the manner that is non-critical. Mm -hmm. Look, I think, I think there was this strand of thinking within the administration. Um, but by the way, not exclusively within the administration. I think you would have seen this strand of thinking within both sides of the political aisle that um, Islamism had a certain authenticity. Uh, Egypt is a uh, large, you know, obviously 90% or so Muslim country, largely what we would consider religious Muslims, people that take their faith very seriously, uh, and therefore uh, many people will be Islamists. By the way, right there, you have a real analytical problem because that's blurring the line between Islamism, the political ideology, and Islam, the faith. And what you saw in Egypt is that very clearly, uh, many Muslims, maybe most Muslims, hard to say, are not Islamists. Uh, and if they were, Morsi would still be president today. Um, but anyway, you had this idea that Islamists represent something authentic, therefore we need to engage them. But I wouldn't even say that's the dominant thinking of the administration. I'd say the administration's dominant thinking was, look, you had an uprising in Egypt. The uprising led to the ouster of Hosni Mubarak. By the time, by the way, the administration spoke on this, February 1st, 2011, Mubarak was already on the way out. The state had collapsed. The police had collapsed. I think, personally, it would have been very hard for him to uh, stay in power thereafter. We could debate this point. Um, but uh, this idea that the administration threw him under the bus is not one that I agree with, because, frankly, I think he was already under the bus by the time the administration uh, spoke. Um, but you had an uprising. Mubarak fell. Now you have elections. Who's probably going to win the elections? The Muslim Brotherhood. True. That's just, you know, that's just a, a, a smart analysis of the situation at that time. The question is, what do you do about it? And the administration's fear was that if it pushed back too hard, if it criticized the Brotherhood too strongly, if it withheld its engagement, if it conditioned its engagement, if it looked critical, who knows what the Muslim Brotherhood might do, right? I mean, these people, as I've laid out, are deeply ideological, deeply hostile to the West, and frankly, function like a cult. So. Let's not, so, let's not anger them. So they didn't think they were moderate? The, the, the admin, I do not believe the administration actually believed they were moderate. What I think the administration believed was they need to justify the outreach by saying, look, you know, these are the moderates, and they're playing by democratic rules, and so long as they do that, we'll work with them. But in talking to administration officials during the time and after, I never got the sense that they liked the Brotherhood, or they thought the Brotherhood was the best. I, I think they felt, these guys are going to win. We're going to have to work with them. How do you work with them? Be nice to them. 
you know, they'll see we're not that bad. And if you build that kind of relationship with them, you know, maybe you can have a, a productive strategic relationship. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. The Muslim Brotherhood was much more afraid of Washington than Washington had reason to be afraid of it. And had the U.S. been more conditional, had it withheld, had it made the Brotherhood fear that, you know, something might happen to it if it didn't tow certain lines, then it might have responded in kind. My argument at the time was that we should make the Brotherhood give to get. I just want to tell a quick story about this, that's all right. You know, um, you all maybe remember that in December, excuse me, November 2012, uh, Mohammed Morsi issued a constitutional declaration, created a big upheaval in Egypt. He used that political crisis to try to push a, uh, a theocratic constitution through to ratification. Clashes in the streets, uh, people were killed. It was, a, it was a very messy period and obviously uh, spelt his downfall, Morsi's downfall, um, seven months later. I was speaking, and I, I recount this in the book, with, a, with a, an administration official. And my argument was that the administration should come out criticize uh, Morsi for this, that, um, that you know, if, if the administration didn't do that, it would look like it supported Morsi, for, first of all. And secondly, um, that it might want to use the moment to try to pull Morsi back from the edge, because if this constitution went through, you would have an, import, you know, an important cross-section of Egyptians that just rejected the new constitution and wouldn't play by it. And the, uh, the response from this administration official was, um, Eric, uh, the, uh, the president has a very good personal relationship with Mohammed Morsi. They spoke on the phone six times uh, during the Gaza crisis. You'll recall there was a Gaza crisis uh, just, just before, before this. Yeah. And, uh, and that may be the best leverage we have. And this idea that, you know, by having a good relationship, you could have leverage. And I, I used to joke, this is like a 16-year-old boy saying... Uh, you know, I talk to her all the time on the phone. She loves me. And it's like, you know, it's like, dude, she's stealing your Spanish homework. You know, I mean, so, and I might, I might know what I'm talking about here, you know? So, I, I, I just think, I, I don't think, I don't think the administration got hoodwinked per se. I don't. I, I, I don't think that they like thought the Brotherhood was good. Obviously, in the Egyptian media, uh, unfortunately, there are all these conspiracy theories to the contrary. But I do think that they pursued this relationship in a very namby-pamby way. And, uh, and had they been more conditional, they might have gotten a better outcome. And they certainly would have signaled to the folks that came to power only seven months later um, a very different kind of outlook for the United States. It probably would have put us on much firmer footing for our strategic interests in the region. So the administration got the brotherhood wrong. Many analysts in Washington across the political spectrum got it wrong. Eric Traeger didn't. You list three or four. I got one four, thing right. <laughs> you list, no, seriously, you list three or four things that you did differently than yeah. others. Um, just to mention them, you interviewed low ranking Brotherhood members instead of just the top ranks. Yeah. In meetings within the top ranks, you interviewed the less media savvy, less famous names. The ones, as you describe them, who attend the same meetings, but don't get the talking points of what they should say to the a Western journalist. You never asked about the ideology. You could read that, as you mentioned, looking at their website. Instead, you focused on other issues like organization, like these things. And you never ask them about um, the well-known Western concerns. Are you going to declare war on Israel? How will you treat the religious minorities, women? Does this fully explain why you got it right and others didn't? In a sense, the person you mentioned in the book as suggesting that or part of that strategy to you himself didn't get the Muslim Brotherhood entirely right. Isn't it? In a sense, you approached it with much more initial skepticism about the very possibility of a positive outcome in Egypt as a whole. Um, maybe I, I don't. I don't know that I was uh, that I was so skeptical early on. Look, I mean, I'm you know, I had uh, started the dissertation research in earnest in the summer of 2010. I had done some some stuff there earlier, um, but I, I basically emerged from the summer of 2010 thinking like. Okay, you know, political opposition in Egypt is like just not a story at all. Let me finish this dissertation and get on with my life. 
Uh, and then, of course, I'm there again in January 2011, and I'm witnessing an uprising. And obviously, if you're witnessing an uprising and you're seeing people march against a dictator, you do need to start rethinking things. Um, and uh, you know, and I did that. I, keep, I always do that. Um, and so I did have moments where I thought, you know, where, where I was a little optimistic because that's just an inspiring thing. And I always say that, by the way, like you know, apart from the birth of my children, like seeing the first day of that uprising in Egypt was one of the most inspiring things um, I've ever seen. And I really mean that. It's just, it's just not the full story. Um, and, and it's not where it ultimately ended. But, but I wouldn't say that I was always so skeptical. Look, the way that I approached my research with every organization, um, be it the Muslim Brotherhood or the WAF Party or the Zagamu Party or Ayman Noor's faction of the Ghad Party or uh, Musa Mustafa Musa's faction of the Ghad Party. There's some Egypt nerds here who like are totally <laughs> eating this stuff up. So those of you who aren't, I'm very sorry. Um, you know, I, I, I always approached it in terms of, like, how does this organization function? I always approached it in terms of, excuse me, who in your organization connects with the security services? Who in your organization is responsible for this or that? How did you get to this position in your organization? How did you join the organization? Why did you join? Um, you know, what appealed to you? What were the challenges? You know, and, and I would sit with, um, and I did this with, you know, a few hundred people. Um, I would sit with these guys, and I'd sometimes sit for an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes three hours, getting their whole life story. And so I just took the same approach with the Brotherhood. It's an organizational study. How do these things work? At the, at the end of the day, what I was interested in with Egypt before the revolution, before this whole Morsi story that, that feeds the book, I was just interested in, like, what kind of person joins an opposition party under a dictatorship? You know, like, like why would somebody do this? Um, who are these weirdos, right? Um, and uh, I'm, I mean, I'm kidding, but but I'm not in the sense that you know I wanted to understand why these parties existed, what their function was, how they worked, because I do think that there's a relationship to how you join an organization and what that organization is about. If you are, or if it, if you join a political party simply by checking a box on a form at the Department of Motor Vehicles that's probably going to be a big tent party. It has a better shot at it. Anyone can join. If joining an organization consists of a five to eight year process in which you swear an oath to listen and obey, well, that might be a very different type of organization. And what troubled me um, when I moved to DC you know, in, in late 2011 is, is how little uh, you know, this, this reality of what the Brotherhood is, how it works, how it functions, fed into the analysis. I mean, the analysis was basically, look, these guys, um, and by the way, again, I don't think the administration necessarily thought this, but certainly the think tank community did. These guys will win elections, but, but because they'll have to play in politics, they'll moderate, they'll negotiate, they'll make compromises. They'll and become I would, Christian they'll Democrats. Be, they'll become Christian they're, Democrats. They're, yeah. And I would always say, like, these are people who have been vetted for their commitment to the cause. If you ask too many questions, they throw you out. They will banish you. They will sideline you from your friends. This is an organization that is comprised of people who have been vetted for their commitment not to moderate, not to change their view. And nobody wanted to hear that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I appreciate you saying I was right, but, but I, don't, I don't take great pleasure in, in, in being right about this because the truth is it's a very, it's a very sad story um, that has been uh, very tragic in, uh, in, in many respects. But I do think it's something we can learn from in Washington in the sense that before we start looking for moderates, and before we start declaring people moderates, uh, and before we start trying to find heroes, uh, whether it's in the Middle East or elsewhere, we, we might want to check under the hood. We might want to do a Google search. Um, I just, I, I'm just very worried about the tendency in Washington to get Ahmed Chalabid. And I think that that's what happens with the Muslim Brotherhood. Quickly, in the interest of time, the Brotherhood um, assessed the revolutionaries right. Despite their initial success, despite the, the hopes Obama um, described in one interview when his aides asked him what did he want to see in Egypt, he wanted to see the Google guy as president. The Brotherhood knew very well that the Google guy wasn't going to be president, that the revolutionaries were an elite group concentrated in the cities. Despite having this very good, good assessment of the political conditions of the country and of their opponents, they completely missed the mounting public anger against them as we approach the 30th of June. Mm. Here we have all of Egypt's political spectrum agitating against them, 
attacks against their headquarters across the country, and they blamed Christians, the remnants of Mubarak's regime. How couldn't they read the 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 sense, of, get a sense of the Egyptian street? First of all, I just want to say, you know, the uh, the Google guy, well, I, I I have a tremendous amount of respect for, of um, and uh, and he's a very good guy, and he's somebody who has actually, you know, come to America and really made something of himself and built a company that was later bought out. And, uh, and I actually look at him as someone who, you know, um, I, I'm proud that he's here, but, but I also do think it's tragic that there isn't a place for, for someone like him today uh, in Egypt. And I just wanted to, to start by saying that I, think he, I, I just think the world of him. Um, but look, you're, you're of course correct that the, that the Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, missed the, the rising anger against it. And it did that because recall that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, depicts itself and its vision as reflecting the true Islam. I want to repeat something I said earlier. In the think tank world today, there's this idea that the Muslim Brotherhood is mainstream Islamism. And I, I frankly think that that is simply repeating the Muslim Brotherhood's own talking point about itself, that it's the mainstream Islam. And therefore, the Brotherhood believed that its ideology and its political vision was something that was very, very broadly shared um, in Egyptian society, which is 90% Muslim. It's the true Islam. These are Muslims. They support us. Why did it take us so long to reach power? Because there was repression. And then the regime fell, and now's our moment. And so, sure, okay, there are these remnants of the regime. They're in the media. They're in the security services. They're, they're all over the place. And, of course, the Christians never liked us to begin with because how could they support the true Islam, right? And so, but these are... These are not the majority. The majority are with us in every election, has demonstrated that. And, you know, that's why they were so confident as the June 30th, 2013 uprising approached, that they would prevail and prevail very, very easily. They totally drank their own Kool-Aid. Um, and that's not surprising, again, when you understand what it takes to become a Muslim brother. And I always go back to first principles. Becoming a Muslim brother is a five to eight year process uh, in which one is vetted for their commitment to the cause. And a big part of that cause is this idea that whatever it is we stand for and whatever the Renaissance project is about, that reflects true Islam. Um, and again, this is exactly why they alienated people. There is no such thing as the true Islam. Uh, Sunni Islam is diverse. It's therefore contentious. And the second that somebody comes and says, the way I follow Islam is true, I'm mainstream, you're not, watch out, you'll be the target of an uprising. By the way, th this is why I think that, you know, uh, Islamist rule has basically been destabilizing in, in many places where it's occurred. Because the second you have an Islamist group that says, I know the proper way to implement the Sharia, you don't. Well, that's where the contention often uh, boils up and sometimes over. So quickly, as you are aware, there's an um, uh, argument in the United States and a bill in front of Congress uh, to designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. This has been echoed by um, advisors to President-elect Trump during his campaign. We don't have an official position yet from the, the transition team, but at least from those associated with the campaign, they have echoed these calls. Should the United States declare the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization? I, think, I just think it's important to be precise here that the, the bill that was proposed in Congress, at least earlier this spring, was it strongly suggested, of course, that, that the, you know, the, the, the drafters believe that, uh, it's a, that, it, that it's a terrorist organization, but the bill itself was about the State Department drafting a report on whether or not it's a terrorist organization, which, by the way, is the same process the UK um, just went through. Uh, do I think the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization? Well, for sure, there are certain elements of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and national movements of the Brotherhood that are terrorist organizations. Hamas is the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. It's a US-designated terrorist organization. My issue with calling the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization is that today, it's not really clear to me that there is um, an organized Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, since uh, Morsi's ouster on July 3rd, 2013, you've had a thorough decapitation of the organization where the top leadership, the provincial leadership, and I think multiple tiers below that of the leadership are either in prison or exile or in some cases have probably been killed. So that command and control that I described earlier doesn't appear to exist today. You can, you can hear uh, so many different views about both tactics and to some extent even ideology within the organization, which is really a break 
from the past in which this was an organization of deeply committed members, all of whom you know, more or less mar marched in, uh, in lockstep. That doesn't exist. And if that doesn't exist, it becomes hard to say that there is an organization, and let alone that it's a terrorist organization. Now, um, should it be possible to designate individuals who are calling, or organize, calling for organizing violence? Sure. Um, but there, I do think the burden of proof will be on uh, the Egyptian government. Uh, but I, I just think the, the Brotherhood right now is in this period where it's hard to even speak of it as a coherent organization and therefore becomes hard to designate the organization as anything. What I do think the Brotherhood certainly is, though, is a hate group. Um, I think the Muslim Brotherhood's ideology when it comes to religious minorities, when it comes to, uh, you know, certainly uh, other Egyptians, uh, bears the marks of other types of fascist organizations. Uh, and, and I do think that, you know, whether or not government ultimately plays a role in this, and I think there are some very reasonable civil liberties concerns, um, you know, certainly on a social level, uh, it's more than acceptable to try to sideline the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, you know, in the way that we would that we would sideline any other hate group. On a very light note, sure. one fascinating uh, thing that's written in your book is about how the conditions for one to become a supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood: forty years of age, fifteen years as a Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. Now you might know that these are the exact conditions to become the Pope of the Coptic Church. Yeah. You need to have 40 years of age, 15 years as a monk in one of the monasteries. Given that these rules were probably much developed after Banna, he was much younger than 40. Sure. Do you know an exact date where they were developed? Because it would really be quite ironic if the Muslim Brotherhood copied its Supreme Guide rules from the Coptic Church. No, it's interesting. I, I had never... I had never drawn that parallel, and I really, I don't know. I think the, I think the bylaws that I'm citing in the book, I could be wrong, um, emerged, I just can't remember off the top of my head, if they emerged in the 90s. Um, but it's an interesting theory. Um, so, uh, you know, it's the Coptic communities, uh, another contribution, contribution. Yeah. To, uh, to Egyptian politics. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, uh, we have a chance to have uh, some questions by the audience, so please uh, wait for the mic uh, to come and identify yourself and ask your question. Sure. Hi, my name is Andrew Hanna. Uh, I'm a reporter with Politico, but I'm not here as a reporter right now. Um, so my question, it's a little convoluted. You said that the Obama administration could have preconditioned its support for the Brotherhood in order to make it change it, not its ideology, but perhaps its tactics. That kind of suggests to me that a, if not strategic, tactical moderation or modification is possible. Is that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, does that run counter to the idea of the command and control and deep ideology? Like, is that even possible? Because you described a sort of feedback loop earlier where it's not just the leadership telling its members what to do, its members so thoroughly believe what its leaders have told them that they force their leadership to not moderate in any way, tactically, strategically, ideologically. Did your discussions with the leadership suggest that was possible? That's a great question. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that while the Muslim Brotherhood's ideological vision, this idea that it should Islamize the individual, the family, the society, the state, the world, in other words, that it should gain power at all those levels, while that ideological vision does not change and has not changed um, and probably never will change, uh, where it has been flexible and some would say even pragmatic is in its tactics. The fact that that's its vision doesn't mean it has to pursue it right now. Um, and that's why you've had an organization that has worked for now over eight decades for that same vision, sometimes pursuing it, sometimes not pursuing it. So my argument is basically, you know, for, um, for the United States to, I, I would not argue that the United States should have conditioned its very communication with the Brotherhood on a certain type of change because I, I, I think in that environment it makes sense for the United States to be talking to everybody and, um, and I think one of the mistakes that the administration made was not being very clear that it was talking to everybody and making it look as though it was really focused on these particular guys is the first thing. But when I, I'm talking more about when the administration sent a business delegation out to Cairo to try to boost investment shortly after Morsi is elected, or the speed with which it sent Secretary of State Hillary Clinton out to Cairo, as I detail in the book, really at the height of a, of a very, um, very uh, tense but you know sort of behind the scenes power struggle uh, between the Brotherhood and the military shortly after Morsi elected, it should have 
ask the Brotherhood to do something to, uh, to warrant those kinds of gestures. Now, what was the something? I mean, that's really the question, how far would the Brotherhood have really gone? Um, you know, my view is basically that you could have, I don't know, maybe gotten Morsi to renounce his 9-11 conspiracy theories, um, to say something. And by the way, these are things that the administration was considering, what kind of language, but how to do it. Um, you could have gotten him to establish some kind of communication channel. No, not necessarily him directly, but something in his presidential palace to the Israelis because there was a real concern about the future of the peace treaty given the Brotherhood's uh, ideology on these things. Um, again, it's perfectly reasonable to push back on any of this and say like, hey, Eric, didn't you just say this is a cult? Like, how much could you really change a cult? Fair enough. My argument is simply that policy should be about at least trying, at least experimenting, and the approach of let's show them we're really good guys and then they'll work with us clearly didn't work. It didn't work on the strategic level, um, and I would say it certainly didn't work in trying to shape the way it behaved uh, in domestic politics. Uh, hi, my name is Mahmoud Ibrahim. I'm a political strategist from Egypt. Um, I have two uh, questions for you. Uh, uh, how do you explain uh, the theory, which I, which I, I didn't agree with, but uh, that Turkey and Qatar are agent of United States for supporting Muslim Brotherhood in the, in the Middle East? Uh, this is theory. Uh, of course, you, you hear in Egypt about this. The second, uh, uh, how to describe or, or seeing uh, um, someone like Abu al-Futuh, Abdelmenem Abu al-Futuh, in the rule of this uh, things in Egypt and Muslim Brothers would. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, look, on, on, uh, on Turkey and Qatar, I think, I think in Qatar's case, um, there may have been an ideological affinity with the Brotherhood, uh, but what there really was, was a bet. And the bet that Qatar made was that after the Arab Spring, after these uprisings and upheavals, the Muslim Brotherhood would be the next big thing. And, and by the way, in 2011, that's not a totally silly bet. Uh, you have, of course, Hamas already controlling Gaza for four years and no real sign of resistance against it. Um, you have the Muslim Brotherhood ascendant in Egypt. You have the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood as a key player uh, in, uh, in the Syrian conflict, at least on the political level, starting to emerge. Uh, there's some agitation from the Islamic Action Front, the IAF. By the way, never confuse it with the Israeli Air Force um, in Jordan. Um, so, right, in Tunisia, Anahta, right? So, so not, not a stupid bet necessarily. I mean, obviously, in the long run, a very stupid bet. But at the time, a sensible bet if you're sort of seeing the way things are unfolding. Um, when it came to Turkey, I think there, there is a clear ideological affinity for a couple of reasons. First of all, Erdogan's an Islamist. Um, secondly, uh, Erdogan, you know, is an Islamist who overcame a military, and there is a similar set of dynamics at play in Egypt. So, um, at the same time, of course, Erdogan angered the Muslim Brotherhood when he made a trip to Egypt, I believe in September 2011, and Very said, uh, somewhere around there, and yeah. said that, uh, that Egypt should be a secular uh, state, uh, which was an interesting thing for him to say at the time, probably not something he would say now. Um, but so I, I, think, I think we always have to go back and remember, and this is, by the way, true of U.S. policy during this period as well. Everybody was operating in a very new and uncertain territory. Uh, I, you know, I do not believe that the story I tell in this book was a foregone conclusion. I'll tell you, it certainly did not feel like a foregone conclusion at the time. No one really knew what would happen next. Uh, and of course, as it goes in the think tank world, once it happens, it becomes inevitable. It was inevitable and you should have seen it. Uh, uh, it wasn't. And, uh, and I, I try to make that clear in the book, by the way, by only saying what different actors knew at that time without telling you what happens next. Abul Fatou um, is a, uh, you know, obviously a, a longtime Muslim Brotherhood leader who uh, emerged as part of that 1970s generation, recruited by the older Muslim brothers who were coming out of prison under Sadat. He was a student leader um, at Kastralani Medical School starting his own Islamist organizations, merged into the Brotherhood. And I think over time, 
uh, became part of that faction of the Brotherhood that was less focused on power, more focused on outreach. And this was a persistent divide within the Brotherhood between those who thought the Brotherhood should focus on preaching and trying to prepare the society and that that work really hadn't finished, and those that saw the Brotherhood as more of a um, hardwired, insular organization that should look internally until it was time to emerge for power. So those are the Kutubists. And there was th one of the big uh, analytical mistakes of the Brotherhood that many scholars made was to assume that Abu Fatu and that outreach wing, that wing of the party that wanted to uh, sell the message broadly, even cooperate with non-Islamists, you know, in trying to sell itself, there was this view that that wing that he represented was somehow dominant in the organization. And it was a, it was a terrible analytical mistake because, in truth, this was an organization in which the Kutubists dominated the leadership. And that shouldn't be surprising once you understand what it takes to become a member, obedience, 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 and the extent to which this idea of power so permeates its ideology and therefore makes the idea of, well, we should just be doing outreach a little bit less seductive. So, um, you know, he obviously uh, was pushed out of the organization when he said he'd run for president in uh, March of 20, March, June 2011, and I think is uh, still someone who believes in that broad Islamist vision of trying to establish uh, an Islamic state and and revive Islam, but approached it in such a different tactical way that he could no longer find a home with the Brotherhood. And of course, you know, right now he's he's laying low and he's not a he's not a significant political player in any respect. Uh, I think that the uh, Muslim Brotherhood saw the uh, Anton Mubarak uh, revolution as a chance to impose Islamism on, on the country. But a year later, the majority of Egyptian citizens, it seems, viewed it as uh, Liberty. Um, you know, m many, many people of many different perspectives coming out in the streets by the millions. I mean, it's, it's something you, you you think you're going to see only in a Hollywood movie. Mm. And instead of being very excited by this uh, expression in favor of liberty, the American media was very dismayed. The U.S. State Department very unhappy. Who knows what kind of threats were made to the Egyptian military? You know, behind the scenes, but yeah, I mean, it's a total guess on my part. Um, what? Why? Why did the Western media miss that? Uh, why, why did we not recognize a very bizarre coalition in a good way for liberty? I, I would I would just add one point to, to what you said, which is I, I don't feel that the Western media missed the uprising against the Brotherhood. I think, you know, especially after Morsi's power grab in November 2012, there was a deep appreciation within the Western media that Morsi was not governing democratically, um, that he was governing very abusively, and I, I think there was actually very decent documentation of, of that fact. But to your point, which I think is a, is a valid one, why did the media interpret the uprising and then, and then you know, Morsi's ouster the way it did? Uh, the media, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's weird to talk about the media as one thing, obviously, it's a set of diverse voices, but there was this perception in the media, um, as well as in the think tank community and elsewhere, um, that, you know, of a certain narrative in Egypt, that there had been an uprising, a revolution, it had ousted a dictator, now there are elections, Egypt's on a democratic track, and the way Morsi's removed a democratic leader, even with an uprising, is therefore uh, undemocratic. By the way, it is undemocratic. I mean, that's not typically the way um, we remove uh, elected leaders. The problem, though, is uh, I think, you know, the U.S. media, to the extent we could, we could categorize that as one thing, um, was very fixated on a certain process. And uh, frankly, many Egyptians were not. And that shouldn't be surprising. And I'm not. I'm not making any excuses. I, I'm not Egyptian. I, I don't. I don't really have a stake in in the domestic political fights of Egypt. Um, but I will say that this is a country uh, that is, you know, six, seven thousand years old. It had roughly two and a half years of a democratic experiment. It went very, very badly. It produced a radical, incompetent government, and it therefore doesn't become surprising when people, at least for a moment in time, don't have much faith in that process because it failed them. You know, I mean, uh, again, I'm not making excuses. Um, what happened was certainly undemocratic. Uh, but at the same time, it shouldn't be surprising that uh, many Egyptians were not quite as uh, attached to the democratic process as we would be because, from their standpoint, that process had failed them. 
and they had only a very brief experience with it. I'm not one who thinks that that brief experience means it will never happen again. Um, I think your point about people rising up against the Brotherhood because, you know, they felt the Brotherhood was governing repressively and, uh, and uh, you know, in a very theocratic or, or whatever kind of manner it has a lot of merit. Certainly that, that was a strong sentiment. And I was, I was in Egypt um, on July 2nd and 3rd, so I got to witness so sort of the, the end of that. For all these no, 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 no. Twice? No. Coincidence? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but... The American uh, Revolution would also be democratic, not democratic by this definition, right? Um, we didn't get through Parliament. We didn't go through Parliament. <laughs> but look, look, whatever. I mean, the, 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 the I, I, I'm, I think as, as, as analysts and as, and as policymakers, um, you know, it's, it's useful to just try to understand what's happening within these countries and to not be so quick to stand in judgment. Because honestly, like, and, and this is why I, I emphasize, like, I'm not, I'm not Egyptian. I, I'm not the one who has something at stake in, in whether, you know, uh, what happened on July 3rd was a coup or not a coup or whatever. I mean, you know, that's, that's really um, a debate for over there. What I could say is, you know, um, we should be a little bit more attentive to the fact that uh, people might not always be as attached to certain types of processes as we are when those processes fail them. And that's why it was so important uh, if we believed in if, if the United States believed in the importance of a democratic process in Egypt, to try uh, during that brief moment to help uh, Egyptians get it right to the extent that that was possible, and to hold a much tougher line with the Brotherhood when it was behaving undemocratically, because the failure of that process did great damage uh, to the uh, legitimacy of that process for many Egyptians, at least in that moment. Well, we've run out of time, so thank you for your participation. Eric has a train, but I trust that he has still um, some time for anyone who wants to get him to sign a copy of the book or to ask him anything. But thank you very much for coming to the last event that we've had this year at the Hoover Institution. Thank you. Thank you.